morning, Mets fans, and welcome to a Tuesday edition of Driving with Mr. Met. It is a dreary Tuesday, and why not? The Mets uh, went into Philadelphia last night and got smoked by the Phillies. Thanks in no small part to Stephen Matz and his inability to get over anything and to pitch effectively at City Citizens Bank Park. We'll talk about last night's game, the, uh, the, the debacle about the whole Callaway apology, not apology, um, whether he, he owed an apology, etc. Uh, and I want to talk about something I completely ignored about over the, something that happened over the weekend uh, that I completely ignored on yesterday's show. I'll do that today. I'm beginning to think that Steven Matz just really shouldn't pitch at uh, Citizens Bank Park. He, I think the park is clearly in his head. Um, he had one strikeout in uh, in the game last night. Um, did not pitch well. Allowed seven runs uh, through five and two thirds or five and one third, um, or just five. I don't even remember to be completely honest. But any, anyhow. Um, he, he, Matz was not good last night. Um, completely ineffective. The Phillies were all over his pitches. And, you know, the troubling part, the thing that always bothers me so much, is when um, a pitcher is staked to an early lead. Like last night, Matz was given a, uh, a 2 nothing lead in the first inning. And he did nothing with it other than give it immediately right back and let the Phillies take the lead. So the Mets had the lead for like three minutes in last night's game. Uh, altogether, uh, it seemed like every every time the Mets got even or took the lead, the, the Phillies came right back in the next inning. And you got to tip your cap to the Phillies in that situation too, because they did not get discouraged. You know, this is a team coming off of a brutal weekend series sweep to the Miami Marlins, um, same team that scored uh, I think 15 runs total over their last seven games, and they end up scoring 13 last night against the Mets in nine innings. So. Uh, you know, it, look, it's, it's a major league team. It was bound to happen that they would find themselves. I mean, there's some really good hitters on this Phillies team, so you can't expect them to be in that much of a lull for as long as they have been. Um, the perfect tonic seems to always be um, the Mets <laughs> running into uh, running into the team that's scuffling and helping that team get themselves uh, righted and fixed and in the right direction. So. So the Mets dropped the first game of the series. Uh, it was interesting, actually, looking at the standings before the game. Now, I don't follow the Phillies, right? I, I, I pay attention to them, but I certainly don't follow them. Uh, but what was interesting to me is that the Mets were only one win behind the Phillies in the win column, one game behind them in the win column last night uh, before the game. So I'm thinking, like, boy, they could get even, um, you know. But it's, it's just like I talked about yesterday, and with the weekend series, like every time the Mets take a step forward to get just close enough to, to get, make you think again, boy, they, they might be able to do it. No. Nah. No. Nah. Not the case. Um, so the Mets fall to five games under 500 after the loss last night. Um, I... Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, on, the, on the bright side, Michael Conforto had a good day at the plate. Um, he earned himself a game ball for his efforts last night, uh, as does uh, – as does uh, no, sorry. Uh, Conforto gets the game ball. Mats gets the goat without question. Um, Brooks quarter pounders with cheese um, got lit up last night as well, ended up giving up five runs in, in his couple of innings of work. So it was just a bad night at the office for the Mets. Um, in, a, in a string of bad nights that just seem to continue to, to stretch together. Um, uh, but it is what it is, and the Mets continue this four-game set this evening uh, with the Phillies. Hooray! Uh, so let's go back to what happened this past weekend. I, I, was, I, was, pretty, um, I was pretty laser-focused on one thing yesterday, and it was Mickey Callaway. And it's, I'm going to get back to that, actually, because it sort of ties into something that happened yesterday and I was thinking about yesterday. Um, but over the weekend, I didn't mention it at all yesterday, and it was some super positive news. And it's so typical Mets that they would do something, like, really great and screw something up so badly that, that you'd actually forget about the great thing that happened. And that great thing, of course, was Pete Alonso um, tying and then subsequently breaking Daryl Strawberry's single-season home run record by a rookie. Um, that record was set since 1983 at 26 home runs. Uh, now it's now it belongs to Pete Alonso, Pete Alonso, and boy, 
he, he's most certainly going to hit more than 27 home runs this season. Uh, I, I, I think it, it's, it's a pretty safe bet that Alonzo ends up breaking the single season uh, home run mark for, uh, for the Mets franchise, uh, which of course is set at 41, uh, held by Hunley and Beltron. So uh, Pete Alonzo gets the big tip of the cap. Uh, I realized yesterday when I was doing my Game Ball and Goats uh, update that um, that you know I, I completely forgot to talk about Alonzo. So it wasn't all bad this past weekend. Uh, Alonzo had a great series, so much so that he was named National League Player of the Week. So kudos to Pete. Um, so back to the Mickey thing. Uh, you know, watching last night's game, yes, the pitching was dreadful. I mean, Matt's was terrible, uh, but the Mets had a, a very odd defensive alignment last night with Jeff McNeil playing right field, Michael Conforto in center, Dom Smith in left. Um, three guys out of position in the outfield, only one of whom is actually an outfielder, that'd be Conforto, uh, and he'll be the first to admit that he is not a center fielder. Um, he's a good team player, though, so he will play center field as needed. But that works a lot better when there's a defense first guy on either one of his sides. So if Lagares is there, or if even perhaps Carlos Gomez were in the lineup, um, that might make things a little bit easier to to, uh, to stomach for Conforto in center field, where he doesn't have as much ground to cover in both directions. Regardless, um, the defensive alignment was was strange, and I, I, I'm bringing it back to the Mickey thing because I was kind of getting pissed about it. I'm blaming Mickey last night. But the more I, I think about it, you know, the the, the, le- the I can't really blame Mickey Calloway for the fact that he has a shit roster to work with. I mean, not not a shit roster. I shouldn't say it that way, but just an oddly constructed roster for the National League. You know, it certainly doesn't help that Brandon Nimmo is both nowhere near as productive as he was last year and injured and was likely to miss the rest of the season at this point, uh, for all we know. Um, does not help one bit. Uh, it also doesn't help that a guy the Mets invested a good chunk of money in, Juan Lagares, couldn't hit his way out of a paper bag. Um, all, all of these are certainly factors, but it doesn't change the fact that Mickey Collar is looking for offense. And he made the decision to go offense first and stick McNeil in right, stick Smith in left. Um, the, the overwhelming problem that I have with all of this is that while all of these guys are out of place in the outfield, Robinson Cano... And his inability to hit, and frankly, his inability to field, um, he, he sits at second base comfortably. He sits comfortably in the three-hole in the lineup where he's effectively an automatic out anymore. Uh, and meanwhile, Jeff McNeil has to play out of position. I, I'm honestly at the point now where I think Cano has to start start sitting a little bit more often. Uh, and we need to see McNeil playing second base. That's that, To me, that's the only way to move forward with this. Uh, keeping McNeil in the position where he is best suited to thrive and uh, not having to have these guys out of position in the outfield. So uh, I want to see Cano sitting the bench a little bit more. Uh, Whether we believe, whether I believe the stories that came out yesterday from the New York Post about just how involved uh, now not only the Wilpons are, but also Brody Van Wagenen. Um, The story, of course, in the Post was that, uh, in the New York Post, was that um, Brody has been making decisions from home and relaying those decisions to the to Mickey Callaway in the dugout about when to pull a pitcher when to not pull a pitcher etc uh, I don't know how true that is how much how much that is um, some inside source whatever nonsense but the bottom line is, is if shit like that is happening how can I really blame and how can anyone really blame Mickey Callaway for for, for the roster the lineup the decisions he's making about the bullpen or not, or not um, pushing a starter, not pushing a starter. I mean, if Mickey Calloway truly is the puppet, the only thing we could be mad at him about is not manning up and saying, no, I'm not a puppet. I'm your manager. You hired me to be your manager. You want a ventriloquist, go grab a ventriloquist and grab his dummy and he can sit on your lap and you can pull the strings and let everybody see it. But that's not me. You know, we could get mad at Mickey Calloway for that. But of course, none of us have been in a position where we make the kind of money that a man- manager in Major League Baseball makes. Is it worth the endless shit that he has to take? I, I don't know. I mean, yesterday's apology, not apology, was crazy. The reporters were were out for blood. I mean, they were so snowflakey about all this. Like, oh, 
He said a curse word. Oh, come on, dude. Like, I, I kind of agree with Mickey. It was the heat of the moment, and he said what he said, and he was pissed or whatever. He was frustrated. He's a competitor. Um, he sort of apologized the second time he came out. The bottom line is the victim here is Tim Healy. And I don't see or hear Tim Healy saying or doing anything that, that is turning this into the story that it's turned into. So good job to the New York media for uh, making this into something that it's not. And and if you guys want to have a good listen, um, listen to Mike Silva's podcast from yesterday. I haven't quite finished it, but I'm right in the middle of him talking with Rich Catino. And they're talking about the media and how they cover the team, whether fairly, fairly or unfairly. And it's a good conversation. Uh, whether you agree with Rich Catino or not, whether you agree with Mike Silva or not, they have a good, honest discussion about how the media should be following the team and what their jobs really are on the Mets beat. And it was interesting to hear. So I, I enjoyed that. I'd recommend it if you're so inclined. Um, that was, This was all over the place today, and I don't I don't quite know why, but uh, maybe it's because the Mets sucked last night, and I'm afraid they're going to suck again <laughs> again tonight. So uh, we'll... <laughs> We'll see. That'll, that'll wrap it up for today. Sorry for kind of bouncing all over. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow to talk about tonight's Phillies game. So until then, thanks for watching. Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Underscore Met. And as always, let's go Mets. <laughs>